This is StoryBeat, storytellers on storytelling. An exploration into how master storytellers and artists develop and build brilliant stories and works of art that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators of all kinds find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on StoryBeat. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today is the award-winning playwright and screenwriter David Patterson. David has penned over two dozen plays, 15 of which are published through Samuel French. His works have been performed on Broadway, off-Broadway, and around the world. He's the only playwright ever to have three plays premiere on the New York City stage in one month. In 2005, David began writing for film. He adapted his play Finger Painting in a Murphy Bed into a screenplay and produced it under the title Love Ludlow. The film premiered at the 2005 Sundance Film Festival to rave reviews and a sale to the Sundance Channel, the Stars Channel, and Warner Home Video. Love Ludlow was one of the few success stories of Sundance 2005. The screenplay was nominated for the Humanitas Award for Excellence in Screenwriting. David has also written for the New York Times, Movie Maker Magazine, Filmmaker Magazine, and Indie Slate, among others. David's second feature, Disney's Bridge to Terabithia, was one of the most successful studio releases of 2007. David also wrote The Great Gilly Hopkins, starring Glenn Close, Octavia Spencer, Kathy Bates, and Julia Stiles. His short, Open Air, starring Munich's Lynn Cohen, won numerous awards on the festival circuit. His most recent documentary, Don't Stop Believin' Every Man's Journey, won multiple festival awards, including the Palm Springs International Film Festival Audience Award. David is also a professional stuntman, an adjunct professor of screenwriting for NYIT of Manhattan, and serves on the film advisory boards for the Savannah, First Times, Gold Coast, and Big Apple Film Festivals. David served as a panelist for numerous film festivals in the U.S. and abroad, and is in great demand as a guest lecturer and motivational speaker at colleges, universities, and writers' symposiums, most recently lecturing here at the Three Rivers Screenwriting Conference right here in downtown Pittsburgh. David is also, by the way, a fireman. His memories as a 9-11 rescue worker were published in the novel 9-11 Book of Help, with his royalties going to the scholarships for children who lost parents in that tragedy. Well, what a truly great honor it is for me to have David Patterson join me today on Story Beat. David, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a delight to have you. I, you know, we had a chance to meet when you were here at the Three Rivers uh, Screenwriting Conference, and I, I was, among all the things that I spoke to you about and heard about, I was most fascinated, beyond all the screenwriting and the plays and so on, that you did all that work during 9-11, that you were actually down at Ground Zero uh, helping to clear that rubble. Um, how has that impacted your well, not only yourself as a human, but as a writer. How has that impacted your work? Well, I guess you can always try to look for um, good in a tragedy. And I can I can say on a selfish level um, that that tragedy helped me make the career that I, that I have. Um, you had mentioned my playwriting background, and I had been a, a writer for, of plays for some time, and I had... What I thought was a great deal of success, you had mentioned it. I had three plays premiere in New York stages all at one time. One was Broadway, one was off-Broadway, the other was off-off-Broadway. And it was mentioned in the New York Times, the London Times, got a lot of press. Uh, but I couldn't get a single agent interested in me as a writer. Interesting. Uh, cause I, because I was only a playwright. <laughs> And uh, well, there's no so money that, in that's, place. That's the problem. Well, there's no money in playwriting. Yes, uh, you mentioned I have 15 titles published with French. If I had 150 titles published by French, I'd have a really nice car. Um, but in that case, you know, I continued to write, and then 9/11 happened, and I, uh, I have a construction demolition background, so I'm used to working in rubble, and I chose to go down there. I put on my hard hat and just walked in 
uh, to Ground Zero and I worked there for a few days uh, had a huge impact on me. Um, I also had lost a relative um, in the towers, and our town, uh, town North Hampstead, I think, lost 68 My uh, people. So that's, it was uh, it was quite horrible. you know it was quite an impactful uh, thing. And but while I was working down there, I, I, I obviously I had a quite a patriotic swell, so I wanted to do something more for uh, the city and, and my country, and I was actually already too old for New York City Fire Department, but I joined um, the fire department out on Long Island, which I've been with for 16 years now. Wow. But the other thing that struck me was I thought I was a pretty good writer, and I kind of cock- cockily, confidentially thought, well, someone will just discover me. You know, you, you stick at it, you, you work hard. Um, someone will discover your genius and, and you'll take off. It should be obvious to someone, but, you think, don't you? <laughs> but that tragedy showed me that I could be on an airplane one day and then be buried the next. You know, that here I was waiting for something to happen, and life could get in the way of that. And so I told my wife, I said, I'm going to take the small amount of money I do have from playwriting and did the traditional uh, did a little credit card and, and borrowing of money um, to take one of my plays, one of my more successful comedies, and I said, I'm going to turn it into a movie. And there's this film festival called the Sundance Film Festival. Oh, that little thing. Um, which, yes, which I knew nothing about. Literally, I just knew that it was a film festival that was pretty well known. And I said, it's a good play, so I'll just make a good movie, and it'll get into the festival, and then we'll take it from there. Sure. And in and in fact, that's exactly what happened, even though supposedly that's how it's not supposed to happen. And so I think, again, my ignorance and naivete helped in that element. Um, I don't know that there is. It. I don't know that there is one specific path. You know, there are many paths, that's and true. it's one. Absolutely. You know, there are no rules to show business. No. Nope. And, and anyone who tells you there is, there absolutely is not. They're apparently playing um, by somebody else's rules. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in certain ways, you can make your own rules. Sure. Um, the, I mean, the one reason I was able to make my film um, so cheaply is because I had a life outside um, my art, and specifically meaning people knew me in the community. Uh, I was a fireman, so I was able to get a lot of things for free. Um, everything from lumber to foods for the cast to rental vehicles to... Believe it or not, ice. You go through a lot of ice when you make a movie. And I got all the ice I wanted from my firehouse. Um, so, you know, I, I made my own rules in respect to making a film. Um, and, in fact, I, I was one of the first bloggers, paid bloggers, at Sundance hmm. um, ever. I had convinced an imprint company that, you know, does imprints on shirts and, and caps and stuff. And I used to bar, buy pens from them and put my name on them. I said, well, look, I just got into this festival. Um, I love your product. I'd love to represent your product at Sundance. Um, maybe we could work something out. Um, the president was intrigued by that, and he gave me about $15,000 worth of free things. That's amazing. To give away at Sundance. That's a little I, bit of marketing of your own. That's just you doing your own marketing. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm not going to say I'm breaking rule, but it's a rule that a lot of young filmmakers ignore. And, in fact, at Sundance, there's a gentleman named Roger Ebert um, who uh, was there to review films. And one of my friends was passing out baseball caps, and she gave gave him one on one of the trolleys. Hmm. And he goes, what's this? She goes, oh, it's my, my friend's movie, Love, Love. Oh, it's, it's this incredible comedy. And Mr. Eber goes, well, I didn't even have it on my radar, but uh, I- I'll go see it. She goes, well, I just gave you a hat, so you have to go see it. <laughs> and so he went to see it, and on the cover of my DVD it says, Another Sundance Treasure, Roger Ebert. Oh, that's beautiful. And Yeah, yeah. And I was able to get interviewed by Kevin Smith on The Tonight Show because I walked up to him and gave him a baseball cap because he always wears baseball caps. And so, and, and the deal with the imprint company was they gave me all this free stuff, and all I had to do was blog on literally how I was giving it away and how it was benefiting their company to get their name out there. Sure. Um, 
even Coors Light. I got Coors Light to sponsor me at Sundance. They uh, gave me five hundred dollars cash and a bunch of hats to give away and a nice parka to wear. I think the bit what you're talking about, which is the business part of the business and doing that sort of thing, is definitely, as you said earlier, one of the things that many young filmmakers just I don't think they think about it or think think perhaps they can't do it. But marketing yourself in that way is a very important way to get your name out. Absolutely. I, I lecture, I give a lecture called Please and Thank You, The Lost Art of Independent Filmmaking. And the, it basically covers with today, with us emailing and texting and stuff like that, people forget a uh, face-to-face or handshake is so powerful um, to people in business. And people just don't do it anymore. And the way I was able to get so much product and property is I reached out personally to companies or individuals, introduced myself, told them what I was doing, hoping to make this film that would uh, do the festival circuit. And if someone said no, I just said thank you very much. I because I always say, well, maybe I can go back to them if this film is successful, and say, you know, we, we I approached you before, you said no, but now I'm moving on uh, to a new project. Might might you be interested? In? And the whole idea was please. And if they said no, then you just said thank you and move on. I think, and, I and think don't you, burn any bridge and don't burn any bridges because well, you could go back to see them at another date. Well, of course, that's I mean that's a key is to not burn the bridges. I, I think you also hit on a, a an interesting key that's in the ever changing world that we're living in, which is um, that m- many of my students, of course, as you know, I teach here at uh, screenwriting here at Point Park, but. Uh, the I noticed that so many of them don't communicate face to face very well because they're so used to texting and emailing and don't know how to actually interact with humans sometimes. Yeah, it's and, and artists overall, I mean, especially in the writing field, I think they sure. tend to be very introverted Definitely. and 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 are not used to sitting down face to face and talking with someone, but go back to the, uh, the old colloquial term, it's called show business, because there is a business element that you have to you have to get comfortable with, whether you want to or Perhaps not. It is, and it's some tough, for a lot of artists, like you say, it is an uncomfortable thing. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Uh, clearly, you've written you know all these plays, and you've written a number of features uh, um, for motion pictures. Do you have a particular preference at this point? Would you prefer to write movies, or would you prefer to write plays? You know, it's a very interesting question because um, I was I was having this discussion with someone the other day uh, being in New York, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, I had my first successful film in 2005, and I literally have not returned um, to the to the theater world. I've been making films ever since. Is that because and of the money? My, it's because of the money. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, you know I need to make a living as well. Sure. And and you know this probably better than pretty much anyone else even listening to this. You know, you mentioned all my great successes, but there are years in between those successes. So whenever they say, oh, you make a killing making a movie, uh, you can, but then if you don't make another movie for seven years and you balance out that money, um, it, it's not as much as, you, as as everyone would like to think. It's astonishing and, how, how fast the money goes when you're not working. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, the playwriting thing, I, I want to get back to. I really do. Um, but, of course, my agent, uh, who handles me for film, has no interest of <laughs> in, 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 doing the, in doing the theater. And, in, in fact, uh, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here. He, he put me in touch with the theatrical division or play division of my own agency. My agency is a huge agency. And they're like, well, what have you written recently? Uh, play-wise. And I'm like, well, I really haven't written a new play because I've been so busy. Um, but I had written um, over two dozen plays, many of which are just sitting on my shelf. And the person I was talking to, they're like, yeah, well, we'd really like to see something new. And my feeling as well, it's new if no one's seen it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. It is new if nobody's seen it. You could just, and, take, and, you could just and, take something off your shelf they don't know about it and you know, fluff it up a little bit and send it out. Yeah, and but again, that takes time too sure. to, to pull something down and start working on it. And um, 
again, as you know, in film, you always have three or four projects in one level of activity. So I'm, I'm rewriting two different scripts right now that, although there's interest, no one put cash in my hand, you know, that's, that's my concentration right now. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'm, I'm curious, you're writing two different projects at the same time? Or do you keep them straight in your head somehow? What do you do? Oh, yeah, because the genres and characters are so different that they really, you really can't confuse them. Although, sometimes you steal a great line from one project to put it in another, or I have in the past used the great line in both scripts, and then just uh, which if one gets picked up, you go, all right, well, I can't use that great line in the one do, I have. Do you have some? Yet. Do you have some way of keeping track of that? Um, some methodology it, that you use, where you're you're saying, well, I've I've stolen it, I've put them in both. If okay, I've sold that one. How do you remember it? Do you just have that kind of memory? Uh, actually, no. It's funny. I, I recently came across um, a published play. Um, where there was a great line, and then I was going through one of my old, newer ones, and there was that line, so I'm like, okay, phew, <laughs> <laughs> I caught it. Um, I, I don't think there was any law against using the same line twice in your own property. Well, there the isn't. Thing, it's, your, it's your line. Exactly, exactly. So, I, I, again, I'm not. there's no rule to that, but um, I think you also want to look at least that you're creative and you're not rewriting the same thing. Well, that's time, that's time the again. thing. It it wouldn't be it wouldn't be you, you're not copywriting from yourself, but what you are is looking like you're duplicating your work and that that can have a tendency to have people frown at you a little bit if they if they pick up on it, you know. Yeah, and you actually touched on another subject that, you know, as I mentioned, I started out in the independent film world and uh, that I I'd like to say is my wheelhouse. Um, however, I've had great success in adaptions of children's books and so my agent that's all he wants me to do is children's movies you're talking about you're talking about uh, like bridge to terabithia or great gilly hopkins that kind of stuff exactly exactly he's like he's like and he's referred me and he's got me a couple jobs of of rewriting scripts or adapting scripts that actually didn't go anywhere but still they were all in the child either fantasy or youth related thing and uh that's not what I really want to do. Well, you, my friend, have been say, what's called pigeonholed. Exactly. And, exactly. Uh, and, and it's very easy to get pigeonholed in this industry. Absolutely. I'm that go-to guy for children fantasy, and uh, that's really not what my uh, background or, or the, the majority of my work is. But as we all know, when there's bills to pay, um, you adapt, you adjust and you exceed to other people's demands. Well, listen, I've written 90 yeah. cartoons in my day, and I didn't want to really write every single one of them. A lot of them I did, but there were those I didn't. But you've got to you take the work because the work's there, and you want, the, you want some kind of compensation for, to, to live on. Exactly, exactly. Uh, um, so, and, adapt, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, adaptation, you know, I'm, I'm interested in adaptation for a whole bunch of reasons. Not only do I teach a course in it, but I've done a bit of adaptation myself. Uh, probably my most famous work is an adaptation of Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and so it, today it's a gigantic industry in the movie business. Most of the successful movies we're seeing today, whether we like them or not, are adaptations of something, mostly comic books. But in terms of adapting things, when you sit down to adapt material... To talk to us about what you find to be the most important thing you need to do. What do you look for first? What? How do you approach material? Well, as a writer, um, when you're looking at uh, someone else's original material, you really, there's two ways to approach it. You look at it as, I want to adapt that, or I want to interpret that. And you got to be very, very careful about your decision, because once you do that, you really got to commit to it. Um, I will say from adapting children's books, which is pretty much my forte, 99.9% of the time, Hollywood chooses to interpret it rather than adapt it. So give us the difference. That, What's the difference between the two? Well, basically, you take a wonderful children's novel set in the Midwest in the 1960s and decide to put it on the moon uh, you change the 12-year-old heroine heroine to a 18-year-old virgin girl. Uh, and, of course, the, her best friend boy, who's 13, is now 23 years old, an Australian bohunk actor who's looking for his first major film. 
And then you um, decide to, instead of the Midwest, put it on the moon. And, and you tell everyone in the world that this is just going to do gangbusters. And of that 99.9% of the time that they chose to interpret the original property, 99.8% of the time, it's a financial and critical disaster. Yeah. And the reason for that is very, very simple. If it was a successful book, it was a successful book for a reason. And they, if it sold millions of copies uh, or tens of millions of copies, that is the story that people wanted to read. That's the same story people are going to want to see on the screen. Because especially in today's world of the Internet, as we all know, the trolls out there, they're not necessarily just trolls. They're also ratted fans of the original material. Right. And if you are gonna if you are gonna disrupt their their idolized world of what that novel was, then it will bomb. And I, you know, I've, I've talked to rooms with hundreds of people, and I've challenged anyone to come up with an adaptation specifically of a children's novel that was changed and it was interpreted rather than adapted. That was a financial success, and literally. No one can come up with that. Well, Joe jo, Ro, Joe Rowling was insistent that they follow the books in uh, the Harry Potter series, and I think they've done fairly well with that. Absolutely, and and she was pretty much the person that changed the rule of the game in respects to the studios now saying maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to the novels. But I will go uh, make the, a caveat on that. It was only with the authors whose sold tens or, or 20s or 30s or 50s or hundreds of millions of copies. Mm-hmm. The average author, they still think they know better. Um, the uh, Bridge to Arbithia, and I don't want to ruin the ending uh, for your uh, listeners, but uh, I was approached by many, many companies who um, said, we're going to give you a bunch of money and you got to go away and you have to change the ending. Right. And I just went, well, no, that's not the book <laughs> that's not the story and that's not my intention and um even disney came to me back in 94 and said uh we're going to give you a bunch of money but uh, the story just needs a lot of work and we're going to change it including the ending and i said no and then actually once harry potter and all that really started taking off they came back to me in the early 2000s and said well let's talk because maybe we can try to keep most of the story <laughs> in place. And one of the ways I protected that is I attached myself as both the writer and a producer. Right. Because I knew writers um, are literally the least important element of uh, filmmaking uh, when it comes to screenwriters. Or at least that's what the industry thinks. Obviously, the other people, and especially writers, like, no, the writer's the most important. But when it comes to Hollywood... Uh, that's not really the case. In fact, you know, but your viewers may, uh, your listeners may not know, the average film has seven to eight writers. And it's only you know, one or two that get the uh, the actual credit that's for true. writing the film. Especially the big features, and, uh, for sure. Exactly, exactly. So, in fact, Disney fired me right off the bat as soon as the ink dried um, to rewrite it, and they made such a bad uh, second draft the property was um, with 20th Century Fox. They dropped it, and then Disney came back around and picked it up. And uh, they still didn't hire me as a writer. They hired uh, two more writers, and then in the end, they brought me on board to um, fix it. <laughs> you, you you started so, it. You went away. You became cleanup on it. Yes, exactly. And that happens many many times. There's a very famous uh, movie called Crimson Tide yes. with Denzel Washington that had a total of 17 writers. And the first and second writer ended up being the 16th and 17th writer. <laughs> um, but there were a lot of hands in that. Uh, one was a young screenwriter by the name of Quentin Tarantino, mm-hmm. who um, actually wrote a very famous scene, and it, it, it's talking about the uh, Silver Surfer. Uh, Denzel Washington is talking to one of the younger crew members in one of the ways he wins him over because he shows he's a cool uh, com- sub-commanders, because he knows all about comic books. And that brings up a very important thing we were talking about adapting. That's the one thing 
uh, it seems so far that the uh, studios have realized is don't mess with the comics. They really do stay very close in line with the characters. Well, now, those, those fans are rabid. Oh, absolutely. And, they, I, and I know that for a fact, certain. They all come after you is exactly yeah. right. They do come after you any possible way. You know? So, you know, you, you, have to, you have to respect that. And I just think that so often when it comes to adaptations, um, it's not. Now, going back to the individual author, um, that's really up to you, too. I mean, you can see the potential of a story that deviates from the original material, but you actually have two initial challenges, especially if you don't have someone with a lot of money behind you and you're approaching the original owner of the property. Are you going to tell them that you only like part of their idea or a kernel of their idea, um, and you're going to make all these changes? Well, um, part, part, of that, of time, part of that has to do with, you know, if uh, how the what the rights deals deal is with the studio. So if the studio absorbs the rights from an author and the author is willing to let the rights go to whatever the studio wants, then the author doesn't have much say in it, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. But here we're talking about the big guns. I'm talking with about younger, you know, filmmakers or screenwriters trying to get option their first property um, directly from an author or a short storyteller or, you know, a poet or, or whatever. Um, in that case, they don't have a lot of money. And so whoever they're approaching is going to be wary to begin with. Sure. You know, you, you had you um, had one big advantage on Terabithia, though, didn't you? I did. I did. And you can <laughs> give that secret away. I happen to know the woman who wrote um, Bruce Terabithia. And who would that she, be? Uh, happened <laughs> She happens to be my mother. <laughs> so I knew, uh, yes, I knew her pretty well. Yes. In that, in that respect, it, it, it makes optioning and adapting even more terrifying because if you do a lousy job, uh, the family dinners are going to be rather uncomfortable <laughs> around Christmas and Thanksgiving. Did, did you? So, did you? Did you? Were, were you a part controller in the rights prior to adapting it, or did you have to go and get the rights from her just like anybody else? Well. That's an interesting uh, story to tell you. It took me 17 years to get Bridge Terabithia made, and it's not because I'm lazy or I would misplace the script, but the first two was actually getting the property rights uh, from my mother's publisher. I see. Um, it is um, people who work in sub-rights departments of publishing companies. Yes. It's the most miserable job on the planet. And it's impossible on to get planet. rights unless you're well-connected. Exactly. And that's why it even took me two years, because I kept, you know, and this was back before, you know, texting and emails. It was like letters. I would write someone, and they'd say, all right, we'll deal with it. And then months would pass, and I would make a phone call, and they're like, oh, that person doesn't work here anymore. Mm -hmm. And literally, that would happen so long. Finally, I, I called my mom. I'm like, could you please make a phone call? <laughs> and so she did. And, of course, the other thing they were annoyed is I was optioning it for a dollar, which, of course, uh, publishers would prefer that uh, they get a little bit more cash when <laughs> yeah, things are course. options. Of course. It, the, the, it, but yeah, it, 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 it still took me two years just to adapt it, even though I knew the author. That's, okay, so that that's a very good bit of information for um, young and unconnected authors to understand about the business. Unless a work is in the public domain, in which case you can use it uh, however you feel, uh, if it's something that's under that has copyright to it, you've got to obtain those rights somehow, um, or else you're more or less wasting your time unless you just want to do an exercise. Um, and, and without those rights, um, it's impossible to get it made. So um, you've you've got to figure out how to get rights to whatever that work is. And look at the struggle that you had, and you were about as well connected to the author as one could get. Exactly. Exactly. And you made a very good point, um, unless you want to make it an exercise. Uh, you know, when people say, oh, I've already written the script, well, that pretty much is an exercise, um, unless you know it's an exercise, because it's also a danger of the author saying, well, let me take a look at the script. And if they absolutely hate the script, now you got two strikes against you. One, they don't like what you did. 
and B, they may not want to option it to you because they don't think even if your re- your rewrites will will, uh, will be to their satisfaction. Sure. Um, sure. And, and of course, that that's a whole other danger when you're optioning a material. If the author wants script approval, which script approval pretty much is non-existent except for those authors who have sold you know 50, 60 million copies. Um, so, so let's talk about the actual act of adaptation. And in the we'll do it. We'll use Bridge of Terabithia as a good example. Um, you, you know, when you're adapting a book like that, you're not in a screenplay. You don't have the time to put in every single moment that's in a book. You have to figure out what to put in and what to leave out. Where do you begin that process? What do you start to think about when you're saying, "How do I turn this story that has all this stuff in it?" into a movie that runs uh, 100 minutes or 110 minutes. Well, you're absolutely right, because uh, as, as you know, books tend to be 200, 300 pages, and average screenplay is 100 pages. Exactly. But not only that, uh, what, what I sometimes I jokingly say, I say screenwriting is the cheating version of writing, <laughs> because if you took all the dialogue, all the action, if you compressed all those lines, simply single spaced lines you have maybe 15 20 pages of actual typing actual words whereas a novel is 200 pages of single space so there is so much more in a book than you can ever get in your screenplay of course and so you really do have to see what is are the thematic elements who are the most important characters because jokingly or not jokingly, there's a very good chance you're going to have to kill off a bunch of people um, from the book. Sure, or combine and, them, or get rid of them totally is com- right. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Take certain elements of one character and give it to another, so you don't have to have those additional characters. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's very challenging. Who do you kill? That's, that's how I explain it. Who do you kill? And or or who do you maim and then take an arm or leg and then stick it on someone else? Did you did um, you change any of the story itself when you were writing this the, the screenplay? Did you force... in my first draft in my first draft? No, I did not. Um, I I tend to honor the property one hundred percent, and especially when it's such a classic book. I mean, the book was so classic. Now, when they brought on other writers, they had brought on some other uh, thematic elements and did some changes, which I was not happy about. Um, so, as, as I mentioned, I was still a producer. So what I would do after I would lose my argument with the studio is I'd get on the computer, I'd email my mom, and I'm like, Dear Mom, remember that scene that I didn't write that you don't like that doesn't really make sense? Well, I did my best, but they're putting in the movie I'm so ashamed to be your son. I'm so embarrassed that I'm injuring the property. Please forgive me. Love, David. I would send her off the email, but then I would CC a couple of the studio uh, execs. <laughs> and then the next thing, my phone's ringing off the hook. They're like, why are you calling your mommy? What are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, actually, I'm just acting as a producer, notifying the author that the property is now being changed, and, you know, she has approval uh, to certain elements. And so, of course, they would call my mom. They're like, we understand you don't like this scene. She's like, yeah, I don't. They're like, what do you think we should do? She's like, well, I think David's still a producer, right, on the project. Maybe you should ask him because I think he has some ideas. So, of course, these guys would have to come back to me, not happily, by the way. And uh, Well, no, and, because you, you, were, know, I, you, you, were, you were pulling something, you were pulling power on them, which they don't like. No, not at all. Not at all, especially when you're, you're a nobody and they all think that they're somebody but in the end we were able to um really claw back a lot of the original story now we did believe it or not lose a lot of the original readers um just by watching they would watch the trailers of the movie and uh, bridge terabithia has a fantastical element which actually only takes place in about eight or nine pages of the full novel yet in the trailers for the movies the fantastical elements with, uh, you know, just crazy characters and, and the whole magical fairyland. Sure. That was 90% of the um, trailer. And so a lot of the readers said, yeah, n- another book ruined. We're not going to go see it. Um, but I, 
I knew that that was a catch because if just the readers of the book went to see the movie, there wouldn't be that many people. So, you know, in that element, Disney Disney knows how to make trailers. And, in fact, since the reviews came out and they're like, well, it's really not about what you see in the trailers. It actually is about the book. That way we were able to not only claw back a lot of the readers who did not plan to go see it, but then they would promote it, you know, through blogs or, or just texting or letting other people know about it. Um, so it, it, I understood the misrepresentation for commercial value. Uh, so as a producer, I appreciate it. As a writer, you just go, well, if it helps sell tickets and it gets my original vision seen, then, then I'm okay with that. So, okay, so in other words, um, the movie has done okay. The movie did very well in the box office. Well, the movie to, to date is um, close to a quarter of a billion dollars. Is, is that all? Although, <laughs> yeah, that's all. However, my statements from, from the studio still say it's $17 million in the red, and they never expect it to turn a profit. The, <laughs> budget, you... was tw- the budget was $28 million, by the way. So just quick math, $28 million to, to make it. Made over two hundred fifty million, and it's still seventeen million in the red. Have you ever read and, a book uh, called Fatal Subtraction? No, but you have me intrigued. Okay, I'm, you I'm should. Writing that down you right should now. get a book called Fatal Subtraction, written by Pierce O'Donnell, who uh, is a fairly well-known Los Angeles entertainment lawyer. Um, he it's it's entirely about the famous coming to America case with Art Buckwald. Absolutely. And that's what it's about, and and how the studio manipulates uh, money through creative accounting. I think you'll find it very interesting, uh, and I think our, oh, my absolutely. listeners will find it interesting too. It's a very interesting book and very telling about the way that the system is set up, not to favor the artists or the people who have made the work, but to favor the the money itself. And and the listeners might be interested to know also that the biggest houses and the fanciest cars in Hollywood are owned by the entertainment lawyers. It's, uh, not, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the movie stars. It's the entertainment lawyers who also <laughs> help know how to hide and bury those funds um, do very, very, very well. So and, uh, I'm curious when you were adapting, I'm going to go back to the adaptation question again, and then sure. we'll, we'll move on from here. But I'm curious when you were adapting, did you did you actually do any additional research beyond the book itself? Did you need to search for extra stuff? You know, I didn't, because if we go back to whittling it down, you have, you know, you have too much to work with. And so it's, you know, uh, one thing that did change, uh, which the studio had addressed and I initially pushed back on, was the book was written in the 70s. And so I wanted to be completely traditional, faithful, unlike, you know, we want to make it to make it in the 70s. But then also, anyone who knows the film business, trying to make period pieces can be a nightmare. Um, just when you think you've gotten everything down, all of a sudden, some character walks by the screen wearing a watch that was made in 2004. Um, so trying to make things look period, and, and it goes from cars, it goes from everything. It's a big challenge. And so when I was thinking about it, I realized that the book, is almost as popular today as it was when it was first released. Sure. So, so people reading it, they read or almost gloss over any references to the 70s, any references to stuff that really doesn't happen anymore, black and white TVs and such. So it actually is the story and not the time uh, of that. Now, when you start talking about, and I go back to what I was saying earlier, you take a, you know, a medieval mythology story and then set it on the moon many, many, you know, thousands of years later. That is a big leap. Um, mine was simply just trying to contemporize a book that was contemporary back then. And the time that it took place was not nearly as important as the story itself. Because the story could take place at any point. And by following those rules, I did not change the characters. I just brought them forward 40 years. 
All right, so so I, I, I you know we've we've uh, covered Bridge of Terabithia fairly well, and I kind of want to talk about you and your process in your general day to day life as an artist. Um, what for you do you look for? What what do you read? What do you what are you out there seeking when you're trying to find new stories? Wow, that that that's a tough one and a challenge because I'm also a stay at home father of of two boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, one's actually now in college. And uh, I also, as you know, I'm a fireman, and my pager goes off about once a day. Um, I'm very close to my fire. So that chews up a side of my time. And then a few years back, someone asked me to run for political office. So I'm also a New York State commissioner for, commissioner for interstate commuting into New York City. I'm in charge of over a 1,000 parking spaces. That, uh, that's, that's amazing. That, yes. Um, but also for your um, listeners, that's probably my most important job because it's my health insurance. <laughs> so it's, uh, as we all know, you need health insurance. And so um, I'm willing to bet. I'm willing to bet you're the only professional screenwriter who actually also takes care of a, a parking spaces. I, I think, and, and and does stunts on the side too. <laughs> and does so, stunts on the side. So yeah, I mean it. it when I write, when do, when do I read? It's pretty tough. Um, in the old days, I used to have a New York Times prescription, subscription, and I would read a lot of other things. Now, I guess it, it would be the internet. You know, the first thing that pops up is uh, on MSN.com, and you know, you look at the top stories. You try to go off through all the political junk nowadays, but there are stories that intrigue you, and. Another, lots of times my ideas just come from my normal life. Like I said, um, a lot of my contacts aren't in art, so a lot of them are pretty interesting people. Like, I'm the only writer in my fire department, and they actually thought I was, I was, you know, walked in with six heads when I told them I'm actually a writer. Um, because these guys are pipe fitters and cops, and... They're just, just guys. collar guys. They're just guys. Just guys. And ne- I've gotten ideas for characters and stories from them and uh because they got a lot of stories and and firemen like to tell stories and it's not just about fires it's really just about anything are you are you ever going to sit down and write a movie about your experiences in 9-11 um you know i thought about that i have thought about that um it's just i guess one of the things that i hadn't gotten around to Uh, one of the stories is when i was shoveling up ash i found this small oil painting and uh i was able to find the name on the back and i was assuming it was going to be someone who had perished uh in the uh, towers and it turns out it was by a woman who uh, was an executive who was not there but she had painted over 50 of these miniature oil portraits of ships on the high sea and that was on- the only one of 50 that obviously survived um, from the building and it took me weeks to actually track her down and so it's an interesting story um, and so I thought about uh, turning that into a story at some point. Um, but it's just one of those, you know, pinned on the wall, uh, concepts that I just, you know, will get to at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am, I, as much as I love my youngest son, I do can't, I can't wait to get rid of him because then I do think I'll have more time to actually write. Um, well, for a lot of younger writers. Well, let's, have, let's not uh, let him listen to this podcast then. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. He, he's all on my my office in the basement. But uh, you know, for a lot of um, younger writers, they have a lot of time and less excuses. Uh, as you get older, you have a lot more excuses and a lot of less time. Mm, that's for sure. Uh, to, to, to write and uh, balancing it is tough. Um, I uh, I actually do go away um, for the weekend um, to a cabin that the family owns, and I will sit there because there's, you know, there's no TV up there, and I will write there. Um, I actually never really learned how to write. Um, I started writing at pubs in, in England, uh, and so when I was starting on a new project, I actually go to a local bar and sit in the corner and write. It's the, the, the white noise, the clinking of the glasses, all the noise. It actually is, it, it just helps me concentrate. Um, that's your environment again, you need the noise that's my environment exactly and again mentioning that i'm at home there's laundry that needs to be done you know there's a yard that could be raped 
there's always things that you can find excuses uh, to do. Would, were so you, I, I would you say your Would you say your writing was heavily influenced by having grown up with a writer? Um, I would say almost the opposite, um, because um, we mentioned my mom being the writer of Bruce Terabithia. Um, and a lot story. more. She's written a prolifically for a long time. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But Bridge, Bridge Terabithia specifically, uh, what I'm not sure, maybe maybe some of your um, listeners would know, it's actually based on me. Uh, when I was seven years old, I met, uh, I met someone who was also that age, who I thought we would spend the rest of our lives together, and then uh, a, a very bad tragedy happened. Mm-hmm. And both families were pretty much destroyed by it. And so having my life story told, albeit, you know, um, in a in a variance and a basic fantastical element, mm-hmm. a lot of it was very close to me and my friend and our lives. And what happened was the book became extremely successful. And we were very poor before the book. And then we became middle class. We didn't become rich, but we became middle class where we were eating meat three times a week as opposed to one time a week. Uh, we were no longer drinking powdered milk. We were having a regular milk. And I was no longer wearing my brother's and sister's hand-me-downs. So in my vision, we were now rich, and the only thing we had to do was kill my best friend. So <laughs> that's a tough thing for an eight-year-old kid. That is. And so I, I was ashamed of the book. And to a degree, I was ashamed of my mom as a writer. And so I had no intention of ever becoming a writer. Um, it was just something that would, didn't even cross my mind until um, my, my late, late teens, early 20s. Um, I uh, went to England to, become, to, to study to become a, um, a uh, stuntman. And while I was there, I also decided to take a playwriting course because I had already been a professional actor since I was 13 years old. And so I started writing plays. And then later on when we decided, when I was starting to get into screenwriting as well, um, I thought that if anyone was going to make a good version of Bridge Terabithia, it should be, well, me. Why not? (laughs) Someone who knew the story someone who knew the story better than anyone else. Yeah, of course. And most, import- most importantly, would protect the, the, the story and honor the families, the families involved. I think, and, I think the key there is the protection element, that you're, you were protecting something that was um, near and dear to not just your family, but to you personally. So uh, I think that's a, big, that's a big motivator for you to have done what you've done. And I think that's a an important thing to, to hit on for, for writers, there is a level of pride and protection uh, that that any writer will have with their properties. But when it comes to selling your properties, you will reach a moment, a time, where you have to judge how important that protection and that pride is. Because you will have to make concessions um, in order to sell your property and see it made to the taken to the next level sure and and that can be very tough too as, as much as we talked about artists being introverted they tend to also be violently protective yes. of their work yes and and you it's kind of a you know it's a oxymoron for the writer to be so shy and yet so vicious you know when it comes to their property um but that's exactly it. And and, and yet to, and yet writers, professional writers over time, especially TV writers, not features so, so much, but TV writers have to learn to let go of their work because ultimately it is, if it's a work for hire situation, you don't own it. Somebody else owns it and they can do whatever they want with it. In your case, you own the work and brought it or somebody approached you or you went to them, whatever it was, but you have an underlying ownership stake in it. And that's a little bit different than, say, a television Absolutely. Writer. Absolutely. I, I, I jokingly also explain to, to young writers that, or new writers that, you know, a novelist, it's an honorable profession because you own your property. A playwright, it's an honorable profession because you own your property. Yes. A screenwriter, you're a whore because 
your main course is to you're writing something to give away as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, for as much money as you can get it. And so, unfortunately, that's the way uh, the business element looks at you, is how dare you even be concerned about what we're going to do with your property, because you're giving it away, and you're giving it away for money. I like to and think of myself as a mercenary. A mercenary. Okay. That, that I'm, 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 I'm a gun for hire. I'm willing to, to work for someone for pay and give them my best efforts. Um, and I I'm, I'm, may not necessarily lay my life down for them, but, uh, but I'm going to give them everything if they're going to pay me to do the work, as opposed to a whore that might just lay back and take <laughs> it. So that it, in my way of thinking, I think of myself as a mercenary more than a whore, but, but I guess they, there are similarities to the two. <laughs> I guess, and, and that could be a movie right in itself, the, the mercenary whore. The but, or, uh, the, or the mercenary and the whore. There you go. <laughs> or the mercenary and the whore. It's like, well, I think we must have covered one of those two movies every <laughs> once in a while. So. All right, so, but, so, so off topic now a little bit. You've worked and met, obviously, worked with and met tons of people in the entertainment industry. Do you have one really strange, funny, goofy, oddball story in, in your bag there that you could share with us that something that's happened to you that you go, wow, that was just crazy? Well, you, you throw that on me, and, and all of a sudden, so I have to think about all the stories that I've encountered. Um, well, just a great story, um, which I, I just found very unique, and, and it's very special in my heart. I mentioned I'm a stuntman, and um, I was Robin Williams' stunt double for one of his last wow. films that he made. And um, it was called The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. And, you know, he just, warmest, funniest guy. And he was always, you know, on top trying to make people laugh on set. And I remember a woman came up to us in the dressing room because we spent a lot of time in the dressing room since they had to make me up to look just like him. Um, some woman came up and said, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan. I worked with you um, such and such movie. And he goes, let's see, that was like June of... 82. Yeah, I was a huge asshole back then. And she was like, no, 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 you weren't. No, you weren't. He goes, no, it's June of 82. Yeah, definitely. I was a huge... And, you know, as much as she... He goes, oh, I was... He goes, I was off the wall on drugs and stuff like that. He goes, I was crazy. And uh, so it was crazy for to see someone basically admit that. But the most intriguing thing was every time I had to do a stunt, he asked uh, an assistant to br bring him from his trailer to watch it. Um, and, and it was to make sure I was okay. Huh. Um, I had to, I had to do a 40 foot fall and it was a tricky situation where I actually had to land on my face, on um, padding rather than an airbag. Um, and the first person I saw when I was getting off the pad was Robin extending his hand to help me off wow. um, the pad. And he was like, how's it going chief? Okay. <laughs> All right. And on that same film, I had to literally drown in the East River for over two hours. And they had a, they actually had a cord around my ankle, so in case I disappeared, they could just fish me, you know, reel me in. But when I was climbing up the jetty to get out after two hours, the first hand I saw was Robin. He was reaching down. He was holding onto a fence, reaching down to help me up onto the rocks. He was like, how you doing, Chief? Looks chilly. And it, it just really, he didn't have to be there. You know, this man... So famous and so successful, and he could have been just in his trailer watching TV or doing whatever, but he was still concerned about my safety and 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 that I was okay, and it, it really blew my mind. And of course, I was devastated uh, when we lost him, because uh, you know to see someone that caring, not care about themselves, <laughs> or, or so unhappy with himself, it was, it was a true tragedy. We really lost a, a really wonderful gift. Man, but I just feel so honored to have uh, to have spent that time with him. I'd like to say to be his friend. I don't know if we were friends since we only worked together for two weeks, two and a half, three weeks. But yeah, I guess I can say we were friends. You were and, you were uh, comrade in arms for a couple of weeks, and you were a colleague for that period of time for sure. Exactly, exactly. And so um, I th I'm trying to think. That's a good story. I think to give you. I mean, there's certainly plenty of others that are really crazy negative, but I'm going to be nice. <laughs> well, well, David, this 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 interview has absolutely been inspiring and fantastic. Um, we're coming toward the end of our 
our, our time on Storybeat today. We've been speaking with David Patterson, the uh, playwright and screenwriter. Uh, and what I'm wondering, David, is do you have uh, one really good, solid piece of advice or a tip that you can lend our viewers that would help them on their career uh, path towards some sort of success? Absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's a very, very simple rule that you must follow that if you want to commit to, to writing and a, commit to whether it's screenwriting or, or writing a novel or anything, that in the end, you have to make your art a part of your life and not your life all about your art. Nice. Because if you make, if you make your life all about your art, um, if, if your life is all about your art, you're going to go to bed angry and wake up hungry for the rest of your life. Um, you need to have friends that have nothing to do with your writing interests. You have to have hobbies that have nothing to do with your, your writing interests. You have to have a life. And going back to talking about introverts, that may sound terrifying, but it's only going to make you a better person, a better artist, and a better human. You just need to make sure that you experience this thing called life, which supposedly we only go around doing it once. Um, I'm not a Buddhist, so I don't know about how that works for anyone else. But I really think it's so important that you make art a part of your life and your life's not all about your art. Well, that is extremely wise and valuable advice, and, and I thank you for saying so. And thank you so much for being willing to spend uh, all, close to an hour on, on a Story Beat with us today. This has been a terrific conversation, and I greatly appreciate it. Oh, it was my pleasure. Today's Story Beat tip. Unique movie characters are never real people leading real lives, even when such characters are based on real people, as in a biopic. Actors, who are real people, of course, will play such characters, but the basic actions and expressed thoughts of those characters will be written, rehearsed, and performed in front of cameras and a large crew. Those screen characters, no matter how much they are based in reality, can never be more than a portrayal. This inevitably makes such characters no more than simulations of a gripping reality. Unique screen characters always represent a heightened reality. Similarly, screen characters do not equal the truth, only the perception of the truth as devised by the artists, especially the writer, actor, and director, but often this will include the talents of cinematographers, makeup artists, costume designers, scene designers, editors, and so on. Think of how real the following unreal yet highly memorable motion picture characters seem. Don Vito Corleone in The Godfather, Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs, Rick Blaine in Casablanca, Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, Will Money in Unforgiven, Benjamin Braddock in The Graduate, Charles Foster Kane in Citizen Kane, Harry Callahan in Dirty Harry, Notice that each of them are fully formed three-dimensional humans. Some are likable, and more than a few are not, but each is undoubtedly one of a kind. Pay special attention to your characters. Make each of them come alive in unique ways filled by three dimensions of all humans. The way a character looks, the background of each, and how each character thinks. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Center for Media Innovation on the campus of Point Park University. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.